good afternoon everyone welcome to the uh, nhsr monthly webinar series um i'd just like you to kind of perhaps take a quick look at the screen and just remind you that, uh, of the nhsr uh, website uh, and all the various events that are there and kind of the, the the updates and so on so we try and put everything there that we can and likewise we have our place where we do all our chatting and talking uh, is on our slack channel which you can also join um, so, uh, so without further ado, and a big thank you to to the audience always for joining, but also a special thank you to Crystal. Um, Crystal was presenting at a conference, uh, uh, at an industry conference in R, and um, uh, and Crystal kind of agreed to kind of uh, share her work uh, with the NHS community. So uh, I'll hand over to Crystal if I may. Crystal is happy to take questions at the end, so there will be some time to do that. Um, so just bear that in mind. Thanks very much indeed. Over to Crystal. Thank you. Um, I am going to uh, try to share my presentation. Uh, so bear with me. Right. Is it working OK? Can you see the present the slides? Yes, thank you. OK, brilliant. OK, so um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christelle Swift. I work at the BBC and I am going to. Uh, it's basically a presentation that I gave at the Earl conference in September, but because I had a bit more time, I've added a few a few slides, so it's going to be a bit longer than what I did at Earl. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is first talk about the data science function that I work in at the BBC, and then I'm going to tell you about the, the, the theory of causal inference, and then then I'll show you how I had to use causal inference um, uh, when I was asked to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of the, the trailers that we have on iPlayer. Um, so the data science function at the BBC, we actually have more than one, but the one I work in is part of the chief customer officer group. And um, that's basically where we look into things that are to do with uh, the audiences um, to our different products and to um, anything to do with marketing as well. And so that's the data science function that I, I work in. So it's fair to say we are a data rich organization. The way we normally describe it is if you imagine Netflix, Huffington Post, ESPN and Spotify were all rolled into ones, that would give you a bit of an idea of what we cover because as well as traditional broadcasting, uh, we have half a dozen TV channels and 60 radio stations. Um, the BBC is also the largest news gathering organization in the world, and we have what we call our BBC products, which are our online products. That's iPlayer, Sounds, News, Sports, Children, etc. And so the data that we um, have access to, um, a lot of it comes from digital anal analytics, so all the data that we collect from our BBC online products. But we also have um, large scale survey data for anything to do with traditional broadcasting. Um, and also we have uh, things like content met metadata. Um, the people we work in most in my department, um, they tend to work in products, in marketing, editorial and strategy. And the kind of questions that we answer is what sort of content should we produce? How do we deliver curated content for um, our audience? How do we personalize our marketing strategies? Which users are underserved and which might not uh, come back? So now moving on to um, causal inference. So the thing we're trying to do in causal inference is we're trying to assess the effectiveness of a treatment T on an outcome Y. Unfortunately, for each person or unit in our study, we actually only get to see one realization uh, because they either get treated or they don't. So it's very much unlike the sliding doors film uh, from the 90s. In causal inference, unfortunately, you never get to know what happens to Gwyneth if she doesn't jump on that train, because at the point of treatment, you either either get to see what happens if someone gets treated or if they don't get treated. And so the question that we're trying to answer is what would have happened if the treated did not get treated? And that's the idea of this, the, the counterfactual, the thing that did not, didn't happen. And so the real answer, unfortunately, we can't we can't know uh, what it would be, but we can try our best to estimate it. So why can't we just compare the, the treated and the control group directly? Um, so here's this is a, a fake example uh, where I'm plotting the, the distribution uh, of age between my treated and my control group. And so imagine if we're trying to understand the effectiveness of a, a new treatment for heart disease. So 
because older people are more likely to have heart disease, they are also more likely to receive the treatment. And that's what we call selection bias. But being older, that means that they are also more likely to die, unfortunately. So even if our uh, new um, treatment is very effective, if you were to compare the mortality rate between the treated and the control group, you might find that you have a higher mortality rate in our treated group. And that would be uh, obviously not something you want to um, have to report. And uh, we, in that case, this is because age is a confounding variable. It's having an impact on both the chances of getting treated and the chances of death, which is the outcome. The other thing we have to be careful about is this idea of common support. So in my fake example here um, in this study, you actually see that we have um, no one in our study that is under the age of 40 and got the treatment. And likewise, we have no one over the age of 65 um, that did uh, that didn't get the treatment. So you have to be careful of not extrapolating results outside of this area of common support because you haven't got any data to back it up. So how are we going to eliminate this selection bias. So the best way to do that is through what's called a, an RCT, a randomized control trial. And that's where people are randomly assigned to the treated or the control group. And so the only difference between these two groups is the treatment. And we say that before the treatment, they were actually, these two groups were statistically identical. And in digital analytics, we often want to assess the impact of changing something to our websites or apps. And so we can, you know, we can actually uh, randomly assign people to either the version A of the site or the version B, and then we can compare the results. And this is an RCT, you know, it was completely uh, random, uh, random as assignment, and that's what we call an A-B test. Unfortunately, very often um, we don't have access to an RCT either because it's too late, you get the data after the event, or it's too expensive, or it's not practical, and often it's also not ethical. So imagine if you're trying to understand the effectiveness or sorry, the effect of smoking on lung cancer, you can't randomly assign people to smoking or not smoking. And so instead you have to do with observational studies, and then you have to find ways of eliminating that bias. And you can either do that with matching or with weighting. And um, in R, there's a package called MatchIt that is uh, has loads of vignettes, is very comprehensive and explains very well all the different approaches to matching and weighting that you can use. And so in that MatchIt dataset, there is a, uh, sorry, in that MatchIt uh, uh, package, there is a dataset called Lalonde and it's very much like the Titanic of causal inference. It's a data set that you will uh, come across again and again in causal inference. And so this is a data set that comes from a study that was done in the 70s where um, people got offered a, uh, a special training program. And then uh, we wanted to assess the effectiveness of this training program by measuring their outcome after the training program. So here, the, this data set has 614 observations and we have uh, the treatment group, which is, sorry, the treatment variable, which is whether or not they went on that training program. The outcome is their revenue in 78. And we have um, other variables which are pre-treatment pre -treatment covariates, such as um, people's age, their level of education, their race, whether they were married, whether they had a degree, and also their revenue levels in 74 and 75, so before the treatment. So what happens if we just compare the outcome between the treated and the control group? Um, unfortunately, if you do that, you see that in the control group, um, wh whether you're looking at the mean or the median, you would get a higher revenue in 78 compared to the treated group. So that, of course, that would be a, a, something of a, uh, that you wouldn't want to report back on. Uh, you know, we don't want to be saying that we've been wasting public money or that our training was so bad that actually it made people earn less. Uh, but what you probably have realized by now is that actually there is this problem of selection bias here because actually the people who got selected for that training program, they had some very specific characteristics. And so only certain people got offered that uh, treatment. And in fact, you know, if we just look at the different uh, covariates, uh, we can see like the, the worst culprit here is race. Um, on race, you can see in my control group in red and my treated in blue, you can see that the distribution of, uh, of race is completely different. Um, in particular, the, you know, the race equal black, we've got 84% in treated and only 20% in the control group. But it wasn't just race that was an issue. We also uh, had you know, differences in uh, marital status 
they were, you know, the treated um, group, they were also more likely to not have a degree and they had a lower salary to start with anyway. So what happens if we just put everything into a linear regression? Surely we can just control for these things using linear regression. And so here I'm comparing three possible models um, just to show you what happens when you change the, the set of variables. So in my first model in blue, my baseline, I am just regressing the outcome revenue in 78 by the treatment. And that's what you would do if you had an RCT. And that is basically giving you the, the, the exact result that we saw earlier. This is just comparing the mean between the treated and the outcome not controlling for anything. And you can see here the, the mean difference is negative. So the treated had a lower revenue. Um, if you start adding uh, revenue, like past revenue as a, as a control variable in that green line here, you can see we've already moved the estimate towards zero. Finally, in that third example, where I'm just like putting all my covariates without worrying about, you know, which ones might be a good idea to add or not. Um, now I've I've moved my uh, estimate to the positive side. So this is basically il to illustrate what's called model dependence, which is when a small change in your model specification can produce a big change in your the results that you're reporting on. I mean, so big here that actually you go from a negative uh, effect to a positive one. And that's because the predictive model, uh, like a linear regression, that is based on association. And you've all heard association is not necessarily causation. And so if we want to report on causality, we actually have to do a bit more work and we have to try to understand the causal path so we can end up controlling for the right kind of variable. And causal inference uh, is based on several assumptions. The first one is ignorability or this idea of unconfoundedness. And that's saying that the treatment assignment is independent of the outcome once we've controlled for a specific set of features. Then the other assumption is called positivity, and that's to say that all the units in my studies have a positive chance of being assigned to the treated or the untreated group. Then there is SUDVA, which stands for Stable Unit Treatment Value, value Assumption. And there's two parts to it. The first one is consistency. So that's saying we have to define the treatment so that it's homogeneous. Um, so for example, imagine if you if you were saying, oh, the treatment is going to see a doctor. Well, that, that's not specific enough because different doctors might have, you know, different, pr prescribe different treatments. So that wouldn't work. Um, the other assumption is no interference, um, and that's basically no spillover effect. So if you're treating someone, you don't want someone else in the study to be impacted by the treatments of the first person. And again, you could think of in agriculture, if you were testing the effectiveness of a, a new fertilizer or a new pesticide, you have to be careful that your plots are not being contaminated uh, by the neighbor, neighboring plots. So let's go. Uh, a bit deeper in this idea in, in, uh, of unconfidentness because that's kind of the, the main one, I think, here. And so observational studies, they rely on this assumption, which is no unmeasured, unmeasured confounders. And so that's the assumption that we are measuring. And so therefore we're able to control for all the factors that are influencing our treatment and our outcome. And so in the literature, you'll see it specified as uh, T independent of Y given X. And I, I was a bit confused by that when I first saw that equation. It's not saying that the treatment has no impact on the outcome. It's saying that given those covariates X, the treatment has as much chance of being given to people who might benefit from it than those who might not. And so it's again going back to this idea of having two groups that are equivalent before the treatment, like you would have in an RCT. And so another way of thinking of contrary for confounders, it's you know saying all other things, relevant things being equal. So now, um, really a good thing to do when you start a causal inference project is you have to map out your beliefs using uh, domain knowledge and you do that using a causal graph and a causal graph is a directed acyclic graph where you're just plotting all all the things you can think of what is influencing the outcome what's influencing the treatment are there things that you think are important but we can't measure them directly so maybe you need a proxy variable um, so for example here in this uh, in this graph we have intelligence we might not be able to measure that directly but maybe act uh, results are a good proxy for that and when I talked about, you know, we have to control for the right kind of variable, I'm going to show you an example of which kind of variables you might have in that, in that causal graph. So the first one we've already covered, it's the confounder. And so the confounder is 
as you see uh, with the arrows pointing out, it's something that has an influence on both uh, the treatment and the outcome. So here the example being, you know, we want to understand the effect of this new drug on uh, treating uh, heart disease. And you can see that age is the confounder and uh, we really have to control for any confounder. So that's a really important one. The second type of variable is what's called a mediator. And a mediator is something that stands in the way of the causal path. So you can see again the direction of the arrows here. Uh, it's in the causal path. And what happens is um, this mediator, they explain away part of the causal effect. And so they, there's, uh, you know, depending on what you want to do, you may or you may want, uh, you may or may not want to have it in in your uh, in your equations. Um, you know, it might be a good thing to understand uh, the effect uh, that this mediator has. So you might want to compare your models with or without them. And so as an example here, if you imagine like uh, we want to understand the effect of the number of children uh, in your household on your household income. So there is a mediator variable here, which is, uh, you know, number of children is impacting on the number of hours that you can uh, you can work. And so that is really what's having an impact on your household income. Third type of variable is the uh, common effect, so the collider. So you can see this is kind of the reverse of the confounder. Instead of the arrows pointing out, they are pointing towards the collider. And so basically, if you control for a collider, what happens is you are turning two variables that might be uh, previously completely independent in your data set. And suddenly, by just adding this collider, you're turning them into dependent variables. That is very bad because it's going to introduce bias and it's going to open a previously closed causal pass. So trying to explain, to give an example here, imagine if like in a total population, you have like uh, musical talent and, and um, high grades at school, and these two variables are completely independent. You have, you know, you can be very musically talented and it has no impact on your, on your grades at school. However, you decide that you're going to control for a school that's giving out a scholarship either on people who have uh, uh, outstanding musical talent or people who have outstanding high grades. And that suddenly you are adding something that's going to explain away uh, part of this uh, this variance here. So you should not you should never control for a collider. The fourth type of variable is what's called a moderator and a moderator is a bit different now because it's something that sits on uh, it sits above the path of the uh, the causal path. So what it does, it's basically altering the effect of the treatment on the outcome. And you can control for them if you suspect they exist and you are interested in them, because what they do is is they are adding like a heterogeneous effect. Um, and so, for example, here, uh, imagine that you you want to test whether um, some countries are, uh, you know, we would increase the sale of a soft drink if you were changing the material of, a, of the bottle of that drink. So, you know, uh, you're trying in different countries, uh, plastic against uh, glass, and actually in some countries, people prefer glass and other countries, they prefer uh, plastic. So, um, again, that is really depending on your, on your study, uh, whether or not you want to include a moderator. So as I said, adding the wrong type of variable as a control can actually have the reverse effect of what you're trying to do. It can increase the bias and it can even lead you to draw the wrong conclusion. So always control for a confounder, never control for a collider. And then the other two, it kind of depends on your uh, on your study. Right, so now that we've decided what uh, set of variables we want to control for, we are now going to have to create these balance groups that I've been talking about. So we can do it um, either using all these covariates in the multivariate sense, or we can kind of neatly condense them into just one metric called the propensity score. Um, and I'll explain what that is in the further slides. And then you can either use matching or weighting. But the thing with matching is it means you're going to have to measure the statistical distance between all pairs of control and treated, um, which if you have a lot of pairs, that might be a problem. Um, Whereas in weighting, what happens is each person in your data set is going to get one weight and then you can use these weights in any subsequent calculation. So matching is all about finding a statistical twin. And so, as I said, like for each treated unit, you're going to calculate the statistical distance with all their control units using these covariates that you want to control for. And then you might have to do some compromises. You might say, OK, well, you know, maybe, uh, you know, 
a, a distance of age in in one is not maybe a, a big issue and you know you might not because you might not be able to match exactly on all your covariates and so your your good enough level your tolerance is determined by um, something called a caliper and so here, this example, you can see that we've uh, we've matched a female to another female, and but the the treated was 11 years old, and we couldn't find anyone that was th that age in control. So we we just went for uh, a 12 year old and hope that it's going to be good enough. And so um, in the matching algorithm, you can actually decide what distance metric you want to use. It might not be Euclidean, might be uh, something else. Um, there are different algorithms as well that you can uh, pick from, and you can decide whether you want to have a one-to-one -one matching or one-to-n matching, etc. cetera. Um, but what happens is like if you started with a n treated units, you might end up with like a, a smaller number of match units because uh, you know, maybe in control, we don't have anyone that matches um, our treated units. And that's kind of reflecting this, this idea that I talked about before, the, the, um, this idea of the common support in your distributions. And so the, here's an example uh, with the Matchit package and our Lalonde data set. So in, uh, in Matchit, you create this Matchit object. Uh, the first thing you have to specify is which variable in your data set is your treatment and which ones are your covariates. And you do that with a, this formula. And then here I just picked uh, Mahalanobis distance uh, met method optimal, and it's giving me giving me a, a little summary of what I've uh, selected. And it's saying as well, um, you know, I started with 614 um, uh, units to start with, but my match data set is only 370. And so if you call out summary of these matching objects, it's going to produce these two tables here, which are your comparison between all your covariates before you did any matching. So, for example, here it's saying in my treated, I had an average age of 25, whereas in my control, the average age was 28. And that is a standardized mean difference of minus 0 0.3. Um, of course, the biggest standardized mean difference here is on race equal black. As you can see, we had 84% in the treated group and 20% in the control. And now, if I look at the summary of my match data, you can see that we've improved the situation because now we've managed to increase the percentage of race equal black to 46%, but that is still obviously uh, quite different from the control group. So it's not great. Uh, but what's also interesting to see here is because we've chosen one-to-one -one matching, you can see that we end up with uh, 244 unmatched control units. So here's an example of a, a different uh, method. This is now the same, but using coarsened exact matching. And so what that does is any variable that is um, a continuous variable, it's going to like create some breaks. So for example, here we've got age and it's going to create some age breaks. Um, and then what it's going to do, uh, so that's the coarsened part of the, um, the coarsened exact matching, uh, but then it's going to match exactly on these, on these um, categories because now we just have uh, categorical categorical variables here and so if we just jump straight through to the uh, checking the balance in my match data you can see that now it's absolutely perfect i've got 82 percent on each side um, but that came at the expense of um, getting rid of a lot of our of our uh, treated units we, are, we were only able to um, to match 50 treated to 50 control OK, so now let's talk about this propensity model approach. So a propensity score for a person is their pro probability of being assigned to either the treatment or the control group given a set of um, the covariates. So the way you would typically do that is by uh, creating a GLM of your treatment with all your covariates that you wish to control for um, to as the uh, explanatory variables. Um, and again, it's, it's going to be used to create balanced groups in treated and control by, again, imitating randomization. So typically what would uh, happen is you would see something like that with your propensity scores. You would see that in your control group, the distribution is skewed towards the, the low propensity scores. And treated group, they will be skewed towards the high propensity scores because they were more likely to be treated, generally speaking, because of that selection bias. And so this is how it would look like in uh, in Matchit. So basically, the propensity score is actually the default for Matchit. So to specify that you want to use that, you would just say the distance that you want to use is GLM. And it would just use, you can see that that first equation, actually, that is the formula for your 
propensity uh, model. And so here you can see again, jumping to the conclusion that, you know, we've improved the situation, but again, it's not not uh, not great. Um, so there is another way. So we've just, you know, we've seen various ways of matching the two data sets. There is another way, which is weighting. And so with these um, propensity uh, scores, we can actually derive something called inverse probability weights, IPW. And the way it works is, um, say you, you are interested in the average treatment effect amongst the treated. So in that case, your treated group will become your reference group and they will all get a weight of one. And your control group, they will all get a weight of their propensity score divided by one minus propensity score. Now, if what you're interested is your average effect amongst your entire sample, then your treated would get a weight of one divided by propensity score, and your control would get a weight of one divided by one minus propensity score. And so you might think, well, why, why are we choosing these numbers? It's a bit weird. And actually, you know, like the proof is in the pudding. Um, if I'm using these propensity, um, these, these weights, uh, in in my uh, in my data, you can see like you know when we started with a distribution distribution of race that was very imbalanced in the unweighted case. Once I picked my um, my weights, in this case the ATT weights, so um, amongst the treated, you can see that all the control uh, bars are now matching exactly the treated bars. So now in my um, weighted sample, I have a perfect match on uh, on race. So that is great and it's even more amazing because I actually didn't even have to check that my GLM was any good at predicting the treatment. Um, just using the propensity scores uh, to derive the weights just suddenly really worked uh, extremely well. And that is that tends to be the case um, as long as you have enough sample. It is like magic. Um, so there are obviously we could go through each of these covariates in turn and see how well we are matching the two uh, the two groups, or we can go for a bit more formalized approach, which is using something called table one. Um, so table one is actually a term that comes from epidemiology, and there is a package called table one in R. And so if I use this table one package, it would produce this table, uh, which is very similar to the one that you saw in the um, output of the match it package, and so. As before, it's saying we had 185 treated um, units, and before we did anything to it, the standardized mean difference in age was 2. Point, sorry, 0 0.2. And this standardized mean difference, I'm, I've just uh, put the formula here for the continuous case. It's quite simple. It's just the difference between the two means, uh, treated and controlled, divided by the, the standard error. And um, the formula for the categorical categorical case is a bit more involved, so that's why I didn't put it on this slide. Um, so we could look at a, a table, or we could put this uh, that information from the table into a lovely plot. And there is a, a, a plot specifically to show standardized mean differences. It's called a loft plot. And so you can see here in the loft plot, um, I've plotted the results for the unweighted case in red. And then the uh, the ATT using the ATT weights in green, sorry, the ATE weights in green and the ATT weights in blue. And so you can see here, uh, you know, the these covariates are on my y axis and the absolute standardized mean difference on the x axis. So you remember for for race, we had a standardized mean difference of uh, 1.7. So that's what this point here on the right is showing you on the red curve. And so you can see before we had something that was very imbalanced and what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to get um, standardized mean difference that are under 0 0.1, so that gray uh, vertical line here, or even better under 0 0.05, which is the, the gray dashed line here. And so we can see that our ATE are actually, of course, they are in, an improvement uh, compared to the unweighted case, but they are still way off the mark. Um, compared to this gray line, and actually the ATT weights are doing a really good job. So that's probably what we would want to report on in this case. Um, so again, in MatchIt, you can produce this low of plots using plot summary of the MatchIt object. And this is showing you the white dots are um, your sample to start with, and the black dots are your match sample. So you can see the first uh, model uh, so match its um, object that I produced, which is with a multivariate approach. You can see that we did quite well on all uh, covariates apart from race equal black and race equal white. 
Um, and now next to that, I've plotted the same thing for the uh, course uh, and exact matching. And you can see now that my black dots are perfectly aligned uh, with zero. Uh, so that's really good. But as you may remember, it meant that we had to get rid of a lot of our treated samples. So you can't win on two fronts in that case. OK, so now we've done all this work and now we are finally uh, going to report some results. And so the results that we want to typically report are what's the average of my outcome for the treated group, for the control group, what's the difference and what's the uplift, so the, the, the percentage increase. And so that's four quantities and one of them is a ratio. Um, and so here, as an example, say that my, you know, amongst my treated, my outcome is 10 percent amongst the, the sorry, Amongst the controlled, my outcome is 10%. Amongst the treated, it's 12%. So my difference is 2%. And my lift is 20%. And so if you've used GLM before and you're familiar with uh, the risk ratio, you will note that actually there is a, um, a, a it's, it's basically the lift and, and the risk ratio are nicely uh, linked because the lift is just risk, risk ratio minus one. And of course, the other thing that we want to report on is some confidence interval around those results, right? Because we want to know, OK, we, we observe that there is a difference, but is it actually statistically significant? And so to report these confidence intervals, you have a choice between bootstrapping and marginal structural model. The thing with bootstrap is that in theory, you're supposed to rerun your propensity score, your propensity model at each bootstrap sample. So it, that can be uh, quite time consuming if you have a lot of studies to go through. Um, the other approach is an analytical solution, which is mar marginal structural model. And what it does um, is it's modeling your outcome with just the treatment, but using the weights that you found with the propensity model. So in that case, you'd go into two steps. You'll have, first of all, calculate your propensity model, uh, which is a where you you'd use a GLM of the treatment by the covariates, and then you use uh, the weights that you've calculated from the propensity scores into another model, which is um, modeling the outcome by just the treatment, like you would do in an RCT, but using these weights. And the only thing with that is that the the, the, to calculate the confidence interval, you would have to use a modified standard error for these beta coefficients uh, of your GLM. So I'm going to take you through an actual example. So here I've done a GLM fit of my uh, outcome by my treatment, and I've used my weights, my IPW weights. And so in the outcome here, you can see that the um, that first estimate here, beta zero, that is actually the outcome estimate for your control group. So here in Lalonde, I'm saying uh, this revenue 78 amongst the treated the control group, but balanced, you know, so that the treated and control are the same. That would be on average five thousand uh, dollars. It was the 70s, remember? Um, but if you happen to be in a treated group, then you can add one thousand two hundred dollars. Um, so with this one model, I have now two estimates. I've got my the estimate for the control and the estimate for the difference between treated and control. So as I said, we can't unfortunately calculate the confidence intervals using the standard error from this output. We have to use some uh, something called a sandwich estimate um, of these uh, of these errors. And I, you you might uh, although you can't you can hardly read because of the cross. But basically, uh, using the sandwich estimates, you see that now we have standard errors that are bigger than the ones we had in the GLM output. And that's because the weights basically they introduce some sort of distortion. So you have to account for that. And then you can just plug away these different quantities, my betas and the corresponding standard error associated with these betas to get my confidence intervals and my point estimates for control and difference. Now, to get treated, what you do is you have to create a second model, but now uh, in your treated variable, you're just reversing the order of um, the levels, basically. So now le uh, if treated is now the first level, now this intercept here is the outcome estimate for treated. And then you go, you know, and do your covariance estimates of the uh, the standard error, the sandwich estimate, sorry, uh, to derive the correct confidence interval. And finally, if I'm using a, a GLM of my outcome here, sorry, my a log of my outcome here, so using a GLM with a Poisson with a log link, 
then these uh, estimate here that beta one that is actually the log of the risk ratio and so if you x but x, if you take the exponential of that and you remove one suddenly you've got an estimate for your lift you just have to remember again that you have to also uh, exp and uh, remove one to your confidence uh, bound boundaries and so let's see what happens uh, when we do that in Lalonde. So you can see here, uh, starting, uh, this is showing you the lift. So starting in the unweighted case where we had a negative lift, and now with the, the weighted case using the ATT weights, um, you can see that we have a, a, a positive lift of 25%, which unfortunately they are neither are statistically significant, but you can see how we've moved from a negative lift to a positive lift. Um, and as I said before, the ATT weights, I'm showing them here, but they were not satisfactory in balancing the groups, so you probably wouldn't uh, use them anyway. OK, so uh, moving on to actually using that in practice um, at work. And so um, I've used these techniques to uh, to measure the effectiveness of iPlayer trailers. And um, if you've used um, iPlayer, you may have noticed that sometimes when you press play on your on your chosen program, you might be uh, served what we call a pre-roll, which is just a trailer promoting another program. And so in general, we have about uh, 30 campaigns running every week and they each campaign runs from uh, between a few days to up to three weeks. And you know, we can't just compare uh, the people who are exposed to people who are not exposed um, in our iPlayer uh, viewers because the people who got exposed, they are kind of a refined breed really compared to the average iPlayer user because they are more likely to be a heavier users. Uh, the more you use iPlayer, the more likely you are to get to see a trailer. Um, but also they've already selected to watch a program that was quite similar to the one that we are promoting. So inherently, they are more likely to convert. So if we were just comparing people who got exposed and people who didn't get exposed, it just wouldn't be a fair comparison and we probably overestimate the effectiveness of our campaigns. Um, and so what we want to do is really compare uh, between similar viewers in terms of their recency, frequency and time spent on iPlayer, but also their program and genre preferences and also like other viewing habits, for example, uh, live versus on-demand viewing. And so the other thing as well is because uh, I, you know, like on in Lalonde, you saw we have about 600 uh, respondents in the data set. Now I've got like hundreds and thousands of, of viewers. So that obviously meant that I had to go down specific routes. Um, the first one being that I can't do matching because it would just like it would be raw explosion trying to measure the distance between all my tweeted and all my control um, viewers. So instead I'm using weighting. To use weighting, it means that I have to calculate these propensity models. Um, and again, like standard GLM is actually a bit slow and there are some faster alternatives. And so I tried um, RCPP numerical and fast GLM. And that's where it really pays off to actually uh, read the documentation of your functions because in fast GLM, there is a parameter called method, which uh, you know has a massive impact on the speed. So uh, it turns out that the method three was really uh, much faster than the rest. So that's why I chose. And finally, um, to calculate the confidence intervals, again, I didn't go down the bootstrap route because that would just take too long. And so instead, I'm using this analytical solution, which is the marginal structural model. And then everything is uh, produced every week, running the data every day and it's uh, exposed in a shiny app and it's allowing the media planning team to uh, pick a campaign and then it would give them a bit of metadata about the campaign when when did it run uh, what was it about what was the master brand um, and also it would show them how many impressions um, that campaign got every day and uh, on each day it's showing the results between uh, the conversion rates between the treated and the control the match control um, and so, yes, yeah, so they can just track their campaigns in that way. And so a summary, this, uh, this was actually quite a, really a lot of information in, in even though, you know, it might sound like a, a said short presentation, but it, we have been going on for quite a while now. Um, but the things that we've covered are uh, to summarize, uh, you know, this idea of the counterfactual. So what would happen if the treaty didn't get treated? We talked about selection bias uh, when some people have a higher chance of being uh, treated. We talked about model dependence, how sometimes you can get very different uh, results depending on what we are controlling for. So you have to be careful. 
and we talked about ATT versus ATE. Um, I've talked about causal graph and how crucial they are to establish the list of uh, things that you want to control for. And we talked about uh, propensity model, um, how we can use them to derive inverse probability weights, and how we can check that the, the result, res, uh, resulting weights are actually doing a good job at balancing the, the two groups using SMDs and loft plots. Then we talked about marginal structural models and how we can use them to calculate the effect size and their confidence interval, taking into account the weights. And the R packages that I talked about were Matchit, Table 1, Sandwich and FastGLM. In terms of resources, if you're interested in uh, learning more about that, the first two references here are very uh, accessible, very practical. Um, so they're they're really good, um, really good uh, resources. The next two are like big chunky books, uh, like you know, seminal uh, references uh, about causal inference. And the last link uh, is an article that I found really, really helpful to understand the differences between confounders, mediators, colliders, and moderators, because not only it gives you like some real examples, but also it's um, showing you the effect using um, simulated data sets where actually you know the data generating process and it's showing you what happens if you control for the right, wrong kind of variable. And finally, a couple of online courses. Uh, the first one is the Pennsylvania Crash Course in Causality, which um, I've put a link here on Coursera, but I think it's also on YouTube. And finally, there is the uh, really good user 2020 um, tutorial by um, Lucy D'Agostino and Malcolm Barrett. And there is all, you know, all the video is on, is on YouTube and the slides as well are available on the user 2020 website. And there's even a Git repo. So lots to uh, lots to look at uh, in here and that's it for me so i'm going to exit the show i hope people are still <laughs> sticking around after all of that and if you have any questions please let me know uh, thank you so much that's uh, really interesting i should just say that the first time i heard you speak about this it was very impressive and uh, it, it remains even more impressive now actually uh, the reason being i think you've you've summarized a very complicated um, uh, well, a potentially very complex area, which is relatively new in most statistics courses, um, but you've made it accessible as an overview to practitioners. And I think that's a really, that, that's quite a challenge really. So well done uh, for, for being able to do that. Um, Bristol, we've had some comments, uh, what, you know, one comment really nicely explained. I wish I had this before I had to do this from lectures. Um, so can I just ask uh, if there are, uh, I'll just also check if there are additional questions as while I'm uh, um, looking. Um, yeah, people are uh, definitely saying very, very good presentations. Uh, I'll just um, put the questions up and just go through them. Um, so, so some people re will revisit your presentation, which I think is also very good. I think your pointers on your resources are also very valuable. Um, um, are there any other variables you would want to control for in the groups if you had the data? I think that's for your BBC example. Oh, I see. Um, it's tricky. I mean, yes, it's basically um, the thing that you really want to control for is, is you know, if we knew in advance, you know, the someone's propensity to to actually watch a show, um, that would be great. And because you know, like. The problem we have obviously is, uh, yeah, actually, the problem we have is that there are loads of marketing activities going on at the same time. So it's quite hard sometimes to unpick uh, the effectiveness of the trailer compared to the effectiveness of the a, a poster campaign on the tube or or even like, you know, a show has been promoted on Graham Norton, so maybe that has a massive impact. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to unpick that. And also, of course, um, if you've gone on iPlayer, another thing as well is you get this, what we call the hero page. So you get like something promoted in front of you and that would also have an impact. And sometimes it's difficult to control for everything. Um, so yes, yeah, so if I was able to control for everything that people do, what we call on platform, so which potentially we could measure to everything that people do off platform. So, you know, like walking around in London and seeing a, a poster of the latest uh, iPlayer show, that would be great. Yeah, but we just can't control for everything. Yeah. Um, Crystal, a couple of other questions, if you don't mind. One is um, just, just what prompted you 
to explore this way of thinking about the, the question because um, causal inference is not kind of routine in um, in training courses or in uh, uh, in practice. Um, I think it's just because, you know, as I said, like for a lot of things, we're able to do A-B tests, uh, but in terms of like for for that, uh, for trailers, um, I think there was one, you know, like every test that we we actually are able to do, they do take, they do take a lot of resources in, ter in terms of setting things up and all that. So sometimes, you know, you, you get asked after the event. So I think there was one instance where they did an A-B test, but it was two years ago, you know, and so the mechanism of the, uh, of presenting the, the the trailers had changed and so yeah so it was just like uh, a case of getting the data after the event and then just you know hearing people saying oh yeah the people who got exposed they uh, you know they convert they had a really high rate of conversion it's just like yeah but they are so different from people who didn't get exposed you know you really have to control for these other things you know you can't just say you know uh, you can't comp it's not like for like so even though, you know, obviously we can't control for everything because sometimes we don't have the data on the things we'd like to control for. Uh, you know, you, you kind of try to get a bit closer to the truth by just controlling for the right things. Can I just ask another question as well? Um, I just, the, um, how long did it take you before you, you, trans, you progressed from looking at the kind of training materials to actually applying it to the uh, the problem you've shared with us today how, how long was that for you a few months you know it was a lot of you know trying something and then oh that doesn't really work and then being exposed to different um uh, you know um like courses and all that i think the the first thing i came across actually was course and exact matching and there was someone um, a famous professor who was really saying this is the best thing to do you shouldn't use propensity scores you should always use course and exact matching and and i kind of went down that route for a little bit and then i found out other things it's like it's because like you said it's it's relatively new and so there's a lot of you know like a lot of school of thoughts and a lot of material everywhere and so it's a bit difficult sometimes to yeah make your way through all these uh, all these things and you know the like one of the uh, in the in a in the resources i've listed some books and some of them are quite hard to get into you know and so c compared to those you know the the other the couple of resources that i uh, stated at the beginning they are so much more accessible um, but yeah, it is honestly, it's a few months before I got my head around everything. Uh, and actually, I probably haven't got my head around everything. Uh, you know, there's loads more to learn there. Another thing I came across uh, afterwards called G methods as well, which would allow you to track people through time. So someone might get treatment, uh, you know, uh, on day one, and then they might get another treatment on day 20, and you kind of follow them and you're able to create some simulations of, uh, you know, what happens to different treatment treatment courses. And that was really interesting. And I tried to look to look at that, but I haven't managed to get it to work yet. <laughs> but that uh, is kind so of my so next step. Some important points here, Crystal. I think one is that, of course, it takes time and you have to have, be patient with yourself. Um, but also, I think that the, with, with many of these um, methodologies, there comes a point at which the practitioner has to make a decision about how much they want to move into the theoretical side of it. Mm -hmm. And I and, and I think that, um, and that's always, it's not a divide, of course, but but there are people who are particularly interested in the theory. And, and uh, But I think as a practitioner, you've done ex enormously, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's really, um, amazing progress you've made. Can I ask, are you a team of data analyst scientists or are you? Yeah, we are. We, but I mean, to be honest, it's uh, I have presented my work to I have tried to spread the world as much as I could. But yeah, um, and we, we are going to use causal inference more and more. Uh, but um, it is something that is not. I mean, I understand like people said some of, uh, you know, a lot of it go, went over my head. It's that's completely understandable. You really have to like go through it several times ever before it kind of sinks in, I think. Um, so it is, um, it's, a tr it's a tricky subject, but very interesting one. And um, th there is one technical question which I will ask in a moment, but I want to ask a more general uh, question, which I think is, um, so, so it, in a way, 
the, the work of causal inference reminds us about the beautiful design of a randomized control trial and how it takes away all this complexity, which is which is great. Um, but it also reminds us of how difficult it is then to control for an unrandomized study. Uh, um, so, so like one question is, uh, to what extent do you feel you still have to kind of uh, help decision makers understand the outputs of the work that you've uh, uh, provided? And is there an increasing appetite to do randomized trials in the BBC now? <laughs> Well, we do have, I mean, like I said, we do have loads of uh, RCTs going on all the time. We, we call them A-B tests, um, but, you know, that, that's only something you can do online for a start because you can only randomly assign someone online. You can't randomly s assign someone to seeing a poster in, in the underground. <laughs> so, so yeah, there, are, there will still always be areas to measure marketing where we we can't have an RCT, so we just have to do something else. Um, but we, we, you know, we have a whole team of people who are doing RCTs like day in, day out, <laughs> A/B tests. Yeah, but to be honest, like even RCTs, you can mess them up, which is incredible. But um, you know, again, I, I can't remember in which of the resources that I'm mentioning, um, it explains. I think it's probably the first one actually. It it does show examples where you, you can mess up an RCT as well. That's that's possible. You can. Mess it up. <laughs> uh, uh, well, okay. So, Chris, one technical question is: um, I think when you were looking at the choice of algorithms to use, where you chose the one that I think was the um, was the fastest for your data, mm -hmm. did you have a sense of whether were there any other things that came to your mind while you were thinking about which algorithm to choose? Uh, no, it really was speed because like, when I was running the data, like I said, it's like 30 campaigns day in, day out, massive data sets, um, you know, like everything would take so long to produce, you know, um, that it was like speed was the only thing I was worried about at that point. And, you know, it's like it, as long as they give me the same results, I'm definitely going to go with the one that is fastest. Well, yeah, oh, obviously some pragmatic decisions there, of course. Yeah. Can I, and, and um, how long did it take you um, to build the, the kind of software development, you know, not so. I mean, the, the architecture around so that this becomes an automated tool that can can work every day. Um, it's that's difficult to to say because there were quite a few iterations. Um, so I wouldn't be able to give you a, a precise estimate. But and also, like you know, I always get feedback as well from the from the media, the, the users basically, and they say, "Oh, but could we have that as well? And can we change that?" So. It's not, you know, uh, it's it's a live product that is uh, updated and changed. So, yeah, like I said, the whole project is like a few months. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's um, it's, well, it's, a, uh, it's, Crystal, it's like I said, you've you've done an amazing job of summarizing something very complicated and making it so accessible in one forty-five minute session. Really, I think that's uh, that's great. I think if we were in in, in a, in a in the real world, uh, you, you would now hear a very big round of applause for, for what you've done uh, and a big thank you also for taking time to come. Can I just a reminder to anybody who's on the call as well and uh, it's to perhaps if you are, have not joined, had the chance to join us on Slack, please do come and join us on Slack. Slack is the place where people talk freely and openly about uh, our related things. And I was just going to ask Crystal if, if Crystal had time and she joined us on Slack, I'm sure there'll be lots of interesting questions for you on Slack on uh, when people have a go at trying to follow the footsteps that you've uh, uh, you've identified today. Um, great. So look, I'll just I'll just read one last comment. Uh, um, was um, a brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. And then particularly relevant for use in the NHS. Uh, it's great to see calls and inference. Um, going into a dashboard, yeah, which is which is really great. I mean, dashboards are very widespread, but but ones which are underpinned by causal inference are, are, are quite rare, I think. <laughs> great. Crystal, we wish you a lovely day. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, thank you to everybody else. And hopefully you can join us for further events for NHSR. Do join at the community, do contribute with blogs, do kind of email the inbox to say, suggest any ideas. Uh, the community is as vibrant really as, as the engagement we get. So anything we can do to to support, please let us know. I wish you all a, a lovely day. Thank you very much indeed. Bye bye everyone.